Well, I mean, I think it starts with believing that you can, right? It's all a mindset. So really believing that you can do something. And if you have a nagging idea, like also trying to see it as like your gift, like you have an obligation to the idea to create it, right? And don't deprive the world of your gifts, your creations, your thoughts, your ideas, your businesses, because you have a negative belief that you can't do something. So I think it all starts with belief. And if you want to travel, buy the ticket. Hello, and welcome to the Art of Living Well podcast. I'm Stephanie May Potter, and I'm here with my co-host, Marnie Dotches marmet We created the Art of Living Well podcast to empower you to live your happiest, healthiest, and most authentic life. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and motivating conversations covering health and wellness topics, including fitness, mindset, food, travel, product reviews, and strategies from a variety of experts, including our own bank of knowledge. We are excited to educate, motivate, and inspire you to change the way you perceive health and discover your art of living well. Get ready to feel inspired. Hello, and welcome to episode 115 of the Art of Living Well podcast. Thank you guys so much for tuning into today's episode. Before we introduce our guest, we have a couple of announcements. Um, So it's March already, which means we're approaching the new season, and that means we are going to have our next seven-day functional medicine quarterly liver detox. I don't know about you guys, but I am ready for spring. If you live in a cold weather climate right now, you likely can relate. As in Minnesota, we've had a pretty cold January and February, and honestly, it's been a bit more challenging for me to get outside and take longer walks and just spend time in nature, and it's starting to really affect my mood. And so I am ready for um, the longer days and just warmer temperatures, even if that means 35 degrees and sunny. So we would love for you to join our upcoming seven-day functional medicine liver detox, which provides you the opportunity to boost your immunity, reduce your toxic load and bloating, increase your energy, improve your sleep and digestion in just one week. You'll really learn to tune into your body's unique needs and walk away with a set of tools and a better understanding of your own body and what it really needs. Plus, you will feel so proud of yourself for this accomplishment. We will start on Sunday, April 24th, but you can start, you know, a few days before or a few days after if that works better with your schedule. And I don't want you to just take our word for it. Here is what one of our very recent detox clients had to say. Biggest takeaway from this program was that I am now drinking a ton of water and went away with the sugar-free drinks and diet sodas. I now start my day with warm water with lemon and I have a salad every day for lunch. Thanks for cheering me on and giving me the tools to make healthy choices. So you can head on over to the show notes and click the link or check out one of our social media platforms and get more details and you can sign up today Um, and we'll have the kits delivered straight to your door regardless of where you are in um, in the world. We would also love for you to head on over to Apple Podcast if you're enjoying this episode to please leave us a rating and review. It takes just two minutes and it really helps us reach more people so that others can benefit from the inspiring conversations and resources that we share each week. And if you're enjoying today's episode, we'd love for you to share it with a friend, family member, or anyone who you think may benefit from this information. And of course, please take a screenshot, post it on social media, and tag us. On Instagram, we're the art of living underscore well. And on Facebook, we are at the art of living well podcast. And now let's welcome today's amazing guest who we know you're going to love, Kelly Lewis. Kelly is a women's travel industry maven who is passionate about helping women tap into their personal power through travel. She's the founder of Go Girl Guides, the world's first series of travel guidebooks for women the founder of the annual Women's Travel Fest and creator of Damesley, a boutique women tour company. Kelly has been called a Dame Disruptor by Adventure.com, a travel veteran by Brit & Co., 
and a badass female founder by the Huffington Post. Lewis and her work have also been featured in the New York Times, Forbes, Shape Magazine, Elle, Culture Trip, CNN, Travel and Leisure, and more. Marnie and I absolutely loved our conversation with Kelly. Kelly opens up and shares her childhood trauma and how she overcame all these limiting beliefs. One of the more powerful messages that Kelly shares is just how you can take other people's doubts and negativity and turn it all into fuel that pushes you forward to do the things that someone else told you you couldn't do and to truly live authentically in your own truth so that you can inspire thousands to do the same. You know, although the pandemic significantly impacted Kelly's business, there was a silver lining in it and that is that it provided her the time to write her first motivational and non-travel book appropriately titled, Tell Her She Can't. This episode is packed full of free therapy and lots of inspiration, motivation, and practical tips. One of my favorite analogies that Kelly talks about during this conversation is just how life is full of mountains. And we may feel like we're always climbing and never reaching the top, but when you stop thinking about the climb and you actually just let it be, that's when you're free to ascend and let go of all the things that people have put on you over the years to keep you down. Today's conversation is so inspiring, and it's going to remind you that you are the pilot of your life, not the passenger. Believe in yourself. Listen to that inner voice or that idea you have in your head and share it with the world. And with that, let's jump right into this profound and powerful conversation with Kelly Lewis. But first, a quick word from our sponsor, Thrive Chiropractic. I was first introduced to Thrive Chiropractic over five years ago for kinesiology-based food sensitivity testing. I was so amazed by this non-invasive and inexpensive technique that I took my son to have testing done, which confirmed some of his food sensitivities. Both my son and I now have regular tune-ups, and even my leery husband has felt the immense benefits from receiving chiropractic care, including cupping. With over 25 years of clinical experience, the doctors at Thrive Chiropractic, located in Minnetonka, Minnesota, combine their passion for wellness with a strong expertise in effective treatment approaches. When you first come to Thrive Chiropractic, the doctors are focused on helping you feel better as soon as possible, and they recognize that one type of treatment or technique does not work for everyone. Your comprehensive exam, personal goals, and individual concerns Help the doctors tailor your custom treatment plan for maximum results. Thrive Chiropractic's integrative approach offers holistic and effective healthcare with a full spectrum of complementary products and services, including acupuncture, massage, food sensitivity testing, CBD, and premium supplements. As a special offer, Thrive Chiropractic would like to invite listeners of our podcast to experience the gift of health with a $25 new patient visit, which includes the initial consultation, a comprehensive exam, any necessary x-rays, and first adjustment. Simply visit the website at www.thrivechiromn.com or call 952-746-5612 and reference the Arts of Living Well podcast. When you're seeking effective, non-invasive treatment approaches to support your health goals, let Thrive Chiropractic be your partner in wellness. Call or book online today. Hi, Kelly. We are so excited to have you as a guest on our show today. And we love that we were connected through the podcast community. And I knew the first time that we talked um, within minutes that you had to come on our show and share your experience and message with our listeners. So thank you for taking the time to come on the podcast today and share how you're making travel better and safer for all women. Yay. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're welcome. So Kelly, we know that everyone has a story and we'd love for you to share your journey from your traumatic childhood to founding Go Girl Guide, the world's first series of travel guidebooks for women, and then ultimately writing your own book. Yeah, so that's a that's a long story. (laughs) In a nutshell. In a nutshell. (laughs) In a a nutshell (laughs) from childhood. Um, I'll give you the, the Cliff Notes version. So I grew up in Hawaii, which is an awesome place to grow up. Um, Which island? Really fast. Oahu. Okay. Side of Oahu in a town called Kailua, and which is 
honestly a beautiful place to grow up, except that I didn't, um, I wasn't having a great time in my household. You know, I grew up in a really difficult environment um, with a mixed family. And I mean, mixed like step and half family in which I was really always singled out as the target and always, you know, ridiculed and told that I was different. I was unwanted. I was unlovable. I was too fat. I was too, you know, too, like too always in my books. Like I was just too different, you know? And so I always felt really like put down and then the sort of abuse escalated throughout my life. So I mean, there were a lot of times that I was physically attacked and, you know, held underwater or suffocated with a pillow or, you know, stabbed (laughs) with a pencil, like just, just things that really put me down and reminded me that I was less than right. So I grew up with this mentality that I kind of had to adopt, which was like, screw you actually (laughs) like, screw you. I'm not too fat. I'm not too stupid. And I'm going to do all the things that I want to do. And I'm going to do them because you told me that I can't do them. Right. So like this kind of mentality, this like defiant mentality that I had was really born because I had like a daily fight that I was fighting amongst my household, you know? Um, and I'm thankful for that in a lot of ways because I was able to adopt that mentality that like no one is going to tell me that I am not good enough and that I can't achieve my goals. Right. So like that was born from an ugly place, but it turned out to be a really great thing because that became like my armor that I ran through life with. Um, and I, I ended up doing a lot of great things. Like I knew that I wanted to study journalism So I got into the University of Arizona. I was studying journalism. And then I knew that I wanted to travel. Ever since I was a little girl, I was always wondering, like, it's a very like Moana story, like what lies beyond the shore, you know, (laughs) because I was just so fascinated with what else the world looked like. And all I really knew was like two hours of an island, you know, like shore to shore, like going to the other side of the island felt like really far for me. So I was always excited to see like what else was in the world. Um, so as soon as I graduated from college, I was writing for different newspapers. And then I was like, you know what, I'm putting this all on hold and I'm going to go travel. And I moved to New Zealand, um, and worked for a company that did Lord of the Rings tours, actually. That's um, so cool. It was so cool. It was my, so my husband and son would be very into that. <laughs> yeah, it was so fun. And it was the first time that I got to get enough distance from my past and from people who knew me, from anyone who had any judgments about me that I got to define who I am in this world, what I wanna do with my life and like what kind of a human I wanna be, you know? So um, so traveling taught me all of these things and it also showed me that like, I am so strong. Like I can move across the freaking world with not a soul on the other end and have an amazing experience, create lifelong friendships with people that I ended up living with, random strangers from the internet, you know, get a job, pay my bills, like live a regular life in a completely different country with zero support from friends or family. So like that showed me my strength. And that is what travel has always done for me is like, if you are dealing with something, struggling with something, or you just want clarity on what a boss bitch you are, (laughs) travel because like, you know, there are times in my life now where I'm just like, man, like you hiked Machu Picchu. Like you could do this, you know, like you can figure out public transport in this new city. Like you know how to do this. And so it reaffirms these life lessons. However, after traveling the world for many years, I got to a point where I was like still. And that's when I realized like, I am actually not okay. (laughs) Like I've been running, running, running traveling the world, doing all these things, building all these businesses. And then I found a moment where I was like, oh crap, like I need some therapy. (laughs) Like it's time to actually deal with the stuff that happened to me in childhood and, and all of this trauma and all of this pain, you know, all of this heavy armor, like it's time to deal with this. So I got a therapist, I got two hypnotherapists. I did Reiki. I did, you know, I did yoga. I was like, I am, I, whatever it takes I will do this because it was manifesting for me in other areas of my life. Like I was one of those people that was like, you know, so unlucky in love. 
And people would be like, what do you, you know, you're an entrepreneur. You're so successful. You're doing all these things. And I was dating these jerks, like who would Mm -hmm. take from me. And, you know, I was constantly in this phase of like giving and giving and giving and being completely depleted and always performing and always feeling like I wasn't enough. Right. So I was like, what is this feeling that I'm not enough? And where does it come from? Well, hello, obviously I can trace that back pretty quickly. So I got to the point in my, in my thirties where I was like, I don't care what it costs. Like I will prioritize myself and my well being, and I I'm doing this thing. So it was kind of like a, a six to eight month intensive process that I was going through. Um, and it did wonders for my brain, but only then, right. in in this kind of stillness, could I, was I strong enough to start writing the book that I wanted to write? You know, I was living in New York city for about seven years. And halfway through that process, I was taking a bath and I heard, tell her she can't tell her she can't. And I was like, oh my God, that's the motto of my life. <laughs> like, and what a great book title, right? Cause like, I was always the person that was told that she can't. And I, that's like, it made me do it more. So I sat on that for a long time. Um, I mean, and I got out of the bath and bought the domain, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I sat on the idea. <laughs> so, and then, you know, I finally got to the point where I was like, I think I'm ready to write what has contributed to the human I am, to the entrepreneur that I am, um, and really try to, to share some lessons and like what it takes to walk through the fire and that we are all capable of doing that in different forms, right? So when I wrote the book, I started thinking about my own life, but then I started thinking about all of the badass women that I have met in my career and, you know, just in my life and like very very many of us, like a lot of us have the same kind of story. We all have gone through some real serious crap and we made it on the other side. So I started thinking about resilience and defiance and what makes a person resilient, you know, and why do we shame women for being defiant? Like, this is not like a a characteristic that we encourage young girls to be, you know? So I started doing interviews and I, I literally just put a post up on the internet and was like, Hey, if you've gone through some stuff and you've, you've lived with people who told you that you weren't good enough and you couldn't do things, like tell me what you did and how you got through it. And I got like 300 emails from women who were like telling me their stories, you know, saying like, I was told that I would never be, you know, I would never go to college. And now I'm, you know, a physicist. Like I was told that I would never play basketball. And now I'm a starting forward for the university of Michigan. I was told, you know, all of these stories. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is bigger than I thought. (laughs) This is not just a me. This is not just a me issue. Right. And, and so then I started doing interviews and this was like prime COVID, like March, 2020. So I really, you know, everything else in my life that I do was in travel, everything fell to a standstill. And so it was kind of a good overlap looking back on like, you know, where I was in my personal journey and where the world was. So I just started doing zoom interviews and I was like, tell me your story. Like, tell me who told you that you can't and how did you prove them wrong? And I ended up interviewing like over a hundred (laughs) women and condensing their stories 35 stories made it into the book. Um, and I categorized them into nine different power words. Like this person is a visionary. This person is a trailblazer. This person is a warrior. Um, yeah. And it really became such a beautiful project because in having these open hearted conversations, like we were able to get so vulnerable and so real, so quick. And like that, those, the friendships that were formed just from me being like, here's all of my scars. And yeah. them being like, here's all of my scars, you know? And it, it was like really, really a beautiful project. So in wow. a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> I, so just hearing your whole story, I'm amazed, you know, from the surroundings that you grew up in, you were able to keep that light, I guess, inside of you and know that you were destined for more. And I'm wondering growing up the way that you kind of explained that you did, how did you actually like actually leave and pull yourself away? And do you have a connection still to your family back in Hawaii? So it's funny, right? Because things ebb and flow. So 
when I left and I, I moved out three days after I graduated high school. So I was still 17 and I was like, screw all y'all I'm out. I knew education was my way to do that. Right. So like, I knew that I had to get into college, like, because I knew that I wasn't staying in Hawaii and I was going like the ocean was the distance that I needed. Right. I needed to put water between us. So, um, so that was the first thing. And I was always like really good at school. So the school part wasn't the hard part. The hard part was just being like, you know, keeping yourself every day reminded that there is light at the end of this. Like there is like, there is a place, there's a destination that we can go. Right. Um, and mind you, my step family came into my life when I was three years old. So this started some of the physical abuse started when I was like five And it was just, it was one of those scenarios that you look back as an adult now, right? And I I remember being like so angry, angry at my mom, angry at, you know, angry at my lack of a biological dad at the time, you know, because he he had his own problems. I was just angry that I didn't have a place to go. Um, But I definitely remember being like 11 years old and my mom sitting me down and she said, you know, I'm so sorry that things are the way that they are, but you have two choices. You can let this destroy you or you can use it as fuel to become better than they are. And like knowing, like hearing that lesson and letting that really sink in at 11, I remember being like, you know what? You're right. Like I'm, I do have a choice in this. Like I don't just have to, my life isn't predetermined, you know? And at this point I was hearing, really like gross things from my step family. Like, Oh, you're going to be a stripper. You're going to be a nothing. You're going to get big boobs. And you know, your, your, your life is destined for trash. Like all of these horrible things, which are so misogynistic. Right. But I remember at that point being like, I don't have to take that path. Like I, I get to choose whatever path I want to choose. And so I'm thankful that I had that lesson, even though at the time I was like, just angry. Um, and the other thing that I did was like, well, I was kept focused on my graduation and I was out of the house all the time. Like I was very rarely at home. Um, and like, I don't know, that was good. And it was bad. I had a lot of really great friends that are still my great friends that were like my family, but I also had a much older boyfriend who lived on his own. You know, <laughs> So I was out as much as I could be and I just had to stay focused on like, this is not my forever. And like, I get to decide what my life is after this. So you, you moved out at 17 and did you go right to college from there pretty much? I did. Yeah. I moved to Arizona. Um, and my, I have extended family in Arizona, but I was still 17, you know? So I was waiting yeah. to move into the dorms. And I think the the dorm was like, they had an early move in for people like me who were sort of like transitional so I was alone on this campus like months before college actually started. And I was like, all right, well, that's better than where I was, you know. I'll I mean, figure it out. It's my daughter is 18 right now, and she'll be going to college, you know, next fall. And just trying to think about her in the scenario that you're describing and think about her just like, bye mom, and moving out and being on her own and moving herself into college, like you, your internal strength is unbelievable. Right. But it's like, thank you. Yes, it is. But it's also like, what choice do you have? You know? Mm -hmm. Well, but there are lots of people that would go down a different road. Yeah, Like not everybody is going to choose the path that you took. So you should be very proud of yourself. Thank you. I think it's also just realizing that we have a choice, right? Mm -hmm. Like we do have a choice even when it seems we don't have choices. And that was one of the things that I learned in doing interviews for the book too. It was like, there's always a defining moment where you're like, wait, but I, wait, but I get to decide, you know, I still have the power of personal choice. Even if I'm in an abusive relationship, even if I'm, you know, I have kids and I can't afford to get out of this relationship, even, you know, there's always an element of personal choice and just being reminded that you are, the, the pilot of your life and not the passenger, I think is really um, vital. And I'm glad that I learned that lesson when I was 11. I'm so fortunate for that. It sucks that it had to come, you know, after many years of me feeling like, you know, a target, but it came nonetheless, and it changed everything for me. 
Yeah. And you know, your mom was just doing the best she could with what she had and, and her gift to you were those words and that inspiration. That's it. Yeah. And that's and, what you needed. And our relationship now through the writing of this book, actually, our relationship now is so much better. And I really sat down and like, we had some conversations and I shared some memories that she may or may not have known about at the time. And we had some real closure, you know? And I think like the journey of being the person in this book to being the person who wrote this book was huge for me. And I put to bed so many of these hurts and so many of these false stories that I carried around. And it happens to all of us. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. In big and small ways. So like that, that process was, was actual therapy for me. It was the closure of my trauma loop. Like writing the story of my pain ended my pain in a lot of ways, you know? And I think for a lot of people that write books, especially memoirs, that's part of the process, you know? And that's, that's the silver lining of all of it. Writing the book during the pandemic, like... Yeah, all the, <laughs> totally. All the things. So, totally. But it's so, it's so interesting, right? Because it's like, you know, when you think about the word can't and like who puts that in your brain first... It's not always the story that I have, right? Sometimes it's like just a teacher who was like, I don't really think painting's for you, right? So you're, so you're like, yeah, I'm not good at painting, right? But then you live your whole life and then you get to your mid-30s, your mid-40s and you're like, I really want to paint. Why do I think I can't paint? You know, like we close off these options at a young age when people say like, I don't really see that for you or like, you know, you don't really look good in shorts, right? So you never wear shorts. So you live all of your summers in pants forever until you get to a point where you're like, why the hell do I think I don't look good in shorts? Why do I think I can't paint? So it's like big and small ways that other people's stuff infiltrates our own system. And so now I'm very like cognizant of when someone is telling me that I can't do something and where that's coming from for them, right? Because it's not for me. <laughs> like, it's their stuff that they're just processing. And maybe it's something that you're doing scares them. You know, like traveling seems really scary. You can't do that. You can't go alone to, you know, Tanzania. It's like, yes, I can. I can't thank you for your concern. I can. I'm going to, you know, but I don't have to hold that just because you hold that. Yeah, I could not yeah. agree more. But I, me too. <laughs> I mean, so... Changing gears a little bit, can we talk about travel? Stephanie and I um, both absolutely love to travel, and we both have lived abroad and love experiencing new cultures and know how that can be such a transformational experience. So you mentioned that travel has played such a big role in developing, you know, your strength and your power. Can you share, like, some of your travel experiences um, where you had to stop voices in your head that were maybe telling you no or telling you you couldn't do something oh, yeah. and how you kind of, you know, were able to prove to yourself that you actually could. Yeah. So for me, a lot of these moments happen when I'm hiking a mountain, which is like not something that I like to do generally. I'm not like, <laughs> let's go climb the tallest mountain. And yet I find myself in these absurd mountain situations. Like, <laughs> I don't know why. Maybe I'm just like susceptible. I have FOMO. My friends are doing it. I don't know. But I'm always like, yeah, this is going to be great. And then I get like halfway up the mountain and I'm like, what the hell was I thinking, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> one of these situations I can think of very clearly um, was in uh, Sri Lanka. So we were hiking Adam's Peak, which is... Um, it's a pilgrimage, actually, a religious pilgrimage, because at the top of the mountain, they say there's the footprint of, well, Buddhists believe the footprint of Buddha, um, Hindus believe the footprint of Shiva, um, and Christians believe the footprint of Jesus. So everybody's hiking to the top of this mountain, but it's like 6,000 stairs up, <laughs> and they're all varying levels. So it's not like you can find a rhythm, like some are really big, some are really small. It was so freaking hard. You start at three o'clock in the morning because you're trying to make it by the sunrise, right? And it literally destroyed me. Like all of my friends were halfway up the hill. So then I'm sitting there thinking like, oh God, you're such a loser. You really are so fat. You can't get up this hill. Like, you know, you're thinking all these <laughs> terrible thoughts that I'm really duking it out with myself. And I'm, I got to this point on the mountain where I just sat down and sobbed, <laughs> like sobbed 
hunched over and was like, I can't do this. I'm not strong enough. Everything they said about me is true. I don't, I have no business doing this. Like, what am I thinking? You know, and I will never forget to this day what happened. And I'll just tell you, it's also in in the book, but I'm just going to spoil it for you. Um, So in this moment where I was completely just over it, out of my body, I let out this wail that I have never heard my body make before. This like, like, like pierced, pinched cry, right? And I just like exalted all of my energy. And then I look up and this monk in orange robes was standing right in front of me, just like looking at me, just like waiting for me, waiting for me to finish. And so I look up and I was like, okay, I can do this. And he hands me his hand and he pulls me up And I'm like, what was I thinking? Why did I think I couldn't do this? Like in that split moment, right? You go from being like, this is never going to happen for me. I can't do this. You let it all out. And then all of a sudden I was like, yes, I can. I can do this. It's going to be one step at a time. If I don't make it by sunrise, then I don't make it by sunrise. But I'm getting myself to the top of this mountain, right? So he pulls me up. And I start walking with him and I realize we were 20 stairs from the top of the mountain. Oh, oh like, my God. <laughs> I was there and I just didn't realize that I was there. And if that is not a metaphor for our life's journeys, I don't know what is, right? We don't always know. Like I have goosebumps. We don't always know like where we are on the mountain or how close to the top we are. And it's so easy to give up and get into the rhythm of like, I'm not good enough to make it. I'm not supposed to make it. Everybody else can make it, but not me, you know, and, and to get into these negative loops and really like duke it out with yourself. But when you get past that, you, you keep climbing and you realize like you were already there. You already had all the things that you needed to get to the top of the mountain. You just couldn't see the top yet, you know? Oh my gosh. Well, I remember reading this at the end of the book. I think it was at the end, right? Yeah. And I, it's so much more impactful having you say it, you know, and share it um, verbally, but what great just advice and a life lesson. I feel like this was like therapy already, this conversation for me, <laughs> you know, all the things, totally. things, all totally. the things you're saying, this is free therapy. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> well, but like, listen, life is full of mountains, right? Physical ones, metaphorical ones. We're always feeling like we're climbing, climbing, climbing. But like, I think the thing is when you stop even thinking about the climb and you just let it be, like, is when you're free to like ascend, you know, and to let go of all of the things that people, people try to put on you to keep you down, you know, just, yeah, that, that to me is like, I'll always remember that in like, as like the journey of my, (laughs) of my healing, you know? Well, and I love that that monk was just standing there waiting for you to finish. Like that, that's just like the perfect touch. (laughs) I mean, not that you, not that you made this story, you know, like, it's just like, (laughs) I love that. I felt ridiculous. Like when I looked (laughs) up and it's like this, like beautiful, peaceful, sweet monk with his robes is just looking at me and he's done the hike, right? Like he's just as high on the mountain as I am. And he looked at me, I realized like, oh my God, I, I, like, I, I looked around and I was like, I made a scene. Like, oh God, I, I let out that weird noise, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but then I could laugh at myself and be like, oh God, this is, just, this is just what it is right now, right? I'm just in the middle of this process. Everybody's going through it at different points, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and we're all on this journey together. So it's kind of like, it doesn't really matter when you get to the top, just finish it if it's important to you. And I also feel like I could have just as easily turned around and gone down, but I am the person that needs to finish these things that I start, right? So like, that's important to me as a human. So, <laughs> but, in, but if it's not, but if, if it's, it's not, not a big deal, there's no harm in turning around and walking down also. And I think 100%. that's an important message for people. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, you know, maybe you don't battle yourself on every mountain. I do. I don't know why. Like Machu Picchu, I came out of my body and I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting here, here? I'm very so envious, envious. Yeah. thinking about the fact that you were in Sri Lanka and that you hiked Machu Picchu. Like these are all things that I'm dying to do. <laughs> I mean, they're amazing. Like they change your life in a lot of ways, but 
it's just like, for me, it's like for other people, right? Cause like I have asthma and like, I'm a little overweight. Like I'm not, you know, I was a smoker for many years. I'm not anymore, but it's like, you know, there are things that you think that you can do and things that other people get to do, other people get to experience. And so like be like switching that, like putting yourself in a different position to be that person is really empowering. And the other thing, lastly, that travel has taught me is that people are inherently kind and the world is inherently safe. Like Mm. by and large, people are good. The world is safe. It's just, we hear the opposite so often, but I can't tell you how many times I've been traveling and a complete stranger has come to my rescue. Complete, like, like life angels. Like I'm talking, you know, I was in Thailand once in insane traffic, there was like a diplomat or the king was in town. I don't know. I was on the back of a tuk-tuk and I was trying to get back to my hotel because I had a very important meeting happening with the tourism board of Thailand. and Everybody was going to be waiting on me. And I decided to go run these errands, which was stupid. So I'm stuck. I'm freaking out. I'm like, I don't have a phone. I can't tell them. I know that if I don't show up for the tourism board of Thailand, they're going to put out like an APB on me. It's like, they don't know where I am, you know? So I'm freaking out. And the guy who's driving the tuk-tuk, you know, I'm like pacing and you know, rocking in the seat. And the, the guy that's driving the tuk-tuk is so sympathetic, but there's nothing he can do except he flags down a guy on a motorcycle and he's like, hey, hey, and he explains what's going on. And I didn't even know that he knew what was going on because there was a language barrier. So all of a sudden, before I know it, he's pushing me onto the back of the motorcycle with my bag, right? <laughs> and this guy on this motorcycle just takes off. And I think to myself, okay, this is either amazing or this is how I end up dead. Right? <laughs> I don't know this guy. I don't know where we're going. I don't know if he knows where I'm trying to go, you know? <laughs> like, so, but all of a sudden, you know, I, I just, I'm like, well, I have no choice but to hang on to him, right? And just hope that this is going to work out. Takes me back to the hotel. And I get to the hotel and I'm like, oh my God thank you so much. Like he weaved through all of these different alleyways and like, you know, it was like a half an hour ride. And he took me there and I was like, can I please pay you? Like, what can I pay you? And he was like, nope, nope. I just wanted to help you. I just wanted to get you to where you're trying to go. And I was like, this man doesn't even work in transportation. He just <laughs> saw a woman in distress freaking out in the back of a tuk-tuk and stopped and took me all the way to my hotel with asking for nothing in return. I was like, oh, People are wonderful humans. They really, really are by and large. That's beautiful. We need to hear more of those stories. And you know what, Kelly, it's so funny. We had an interview before this and that individual, very different conversation. People are inherently kind. Like that's what she said too. Yeah. So I'm glad that this theme is starting to come out because right now, especially when we record this, you know, there is a lot of, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of yuck in the news. There's a lot of yuck. Yeah. 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 The news is, they specialize in yuck. So, yeah. you know, it's hard. It's hard to, and it, it, even for me, like the past year, I've, I've been to every continent on this planet. I've traveled to many, many places, largely by myself. But the last year during COVID, when I couldn't travel, I all of a sudden was like, I don't know that I can do it. Like, I don't know how to get on a plane anymore. Is it even safe? Is the plane going to crash? Have they been flying this whole time? So like when I got on a flight and I was, I flew to Jordan a couple of months ago, I was terrified that I was going to actually die. And that is an anxiety that I have not ever felt on planes. Like I am not afraid to fly, but I remember telling my dad, like, you know, if I die, just take care of my, take care of Nate, my partner, you know, I was like, (laughs) why am I saying this? But I was so scared because of the culture that we're living in. Um, yeah. And of course the plane didn't crash. Jordan was incredible. I saw my last of the seven wonders that I had not seen, which was Petra. It was, I cried. Oh, wow. I cried at the foot of, at the foot of the treasury. It was amazing. Right. But like, I, I was there years yeah, ago. It's incredible. But there's yeah. something so palpable about that culture of fear. And like, once you, once you actually do it, you realize it's not that scary. <laughs> you know, it's just so Exactly. Weird. Yeah. So there's so many more questions you want to talk about the book, but just, I know you do some things and before you wrote the book with your businesses, and maybe you can share a little bit about what those are, what you have coming up and then, you know, how, how COVID impacted that. Oh yeah. 
Well, COVID really sucks. It took out, it took, I mean, it took everything that I did away from me temporarily. Um, so I, I started, my first company was called Go Girl Guides. We published travel guide books for women. Um, and when I started that company in 2010, I was like 23. Um, but I just realized that no one was writing the things that I needed to know, like which bus stops were sketchy and like how to find tampons in Argentina, like, like really practical things that my girlfriends were telling me that my books weren't. So I started that company, no experience in guidebook writing or publishing. You know, I was a journalist, but I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, and it worked out really well. So <laughs> we went on to publish seven books. We're now about to release our India guidebook. Um, and then I went on a tour and I was, you know, across the country, driving across the country, talking about travel and about my guidebooks and, um, and having these conversations with groups of women. And I was so, so surprised and humbled by the amount of people that were coming out, you know, like, like grandmothers bringing their granddaughters and just wanting to be in front of someone who travels and, you know, women who live in Indianapolis or like, you know, smaller, uh, not in the so small, but you know what I mean? Like inner America destinations. Um, and I was having these conversations and they would pick my brain for hours, like wanting to talk about what the best airlines were and my favorite trip and, you know, the, their trips too. And so I was like, I need to do this in a bigger way. So I ended that journey in New York city where I moved. And then I was like, I want to do this in a bigger way. I'm going to start a conference about women's travel. So that was called the women's travel fest is called the women's travel fest. Um, and again, zero idea what I was doing. No experience in event planning. <laughs> it was like, here's a concept that I have, right? And it it took off. Samantha Brown became our first keynote speaker. Expedia was our platinum sponsor for many years. Um, and the show's grown from being a one-day event to being a full four-day event with workshops, um, wow. you know, networking events, parties, giveaways. This year, we're giving away 100,000 American Airlines miles. I'm working with, oh. you know, companies like Uber, like companies that I'm, I could never have dreamed of before, right? Just by starting this thing that I was like, I think this could be cool. Um, so yeah, so the Women's Travel Fest started um, and it's now in its ninth year. And from there, I was like, okay, well, I have all these ladies who are here. The energy of talking about traveling is magnetic. Like people are so excited. And I mean, the vibe of the show is just so cool because everyone's just passionate about this thing, Right. So then I said, well, why don't we actually take women traveling? So then I started a tour company called Damesley. And I've been leading um, small group tours around the world ever since. So that started in 2016. And yeah, so I had a, a slew of amazing skills that were completely useless during COVID. Could not travel, could not host live events. <laughs> also, I was a bartender before that. Could not bartend. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, well, what do I do now? <laughs> write your uh, book. <laughs> write my book. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. So what is your favorite? Like, what has been your absolute favorite destination? Oh, so I love New Zealand because it was my first, like, peek into the travel culture, right? And, like, my roommates would tell me about places that they went, and it made me want to go there, and, like, it really just changed my, changed everything for me. I'm glad that I lived, I lived there first. Um, Antarctica is really, really high on that list wow. because it reminded me of what the world looked like before we started messing with it. Like clean, clean water, like pristine snow, you know, it just was so stunningly beautiful that it makes you want to cry <laughs> like it's just it's such a special place and I think anyone who's been to Antarctica would say the same like I went to Antarctica kind of on accident this is my life this is what I like I do all these weird things on accident right so a friend of mine had a tour and she's like I have one spot left she calls me I'm just out of spin class I'm in the grocery store and she's like I think you should take this this trip to Antarctica with me I'm like Haley I am not ready to spend this amount of money. Like I am just trying to get grapes and bread. Like you know, <laughs> It is a Sunday. Like, what are you talking about going out in 10 days? Mind you, the trip was in 10 days. And I was like, um, I don't think that this is going to work. And she was like, no, it's, it needs to happen. And she like strong armed me basically. 
And so I ended up going with 50 women that she had already brought with her. And those ladies on that trip became lifelong friends, have come on my tours, have come to Women's Travel Fest. You know, like we, it, it changed everything. Sometimes these weird things happen. These trips, these opportunities happen that you're like, it seems absolutely insane for me to say yes and fly to the bottom of the earth in 10 days with no cold weather gear, you know, <laughs> minus what I had in New York. And I was like, but for some reason, this opportunity is coming up, right? So you got to say yes to it. So Antarctica, Iceland, that was another crazy trip. You know, I found a flight deal that left the next day. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. So I flew to Iceland the, the next day um, from Baltimore. Wow. So I took a bus from New York to Baltimore and like, it was wild, but I had such a great time and I was by myself. So I met so many people and that's like the big secret of traveling by yourself. It's like, you're really never alone. Like I meet so many people when I'm by myself because you have to, Yeah, you know, you're open to it, right? You're like, you're approachable. So, um, so yeah, I would say New Zealand, Antarctica and Iceland are probably my favorites. Okay. That's, that sounds amazing. I, we were supposed to go to Iceland right before COVID hit, like literally we canceled our trip like two days before we were leaving and I'm still dying to go back there. Um, but you will, it's amazing. I, one of my favorite things about traveling is meeting other people. And I, I don't really travel alone just cause I have a spouse and three children and it just doesn't come to pass that I'm really traveling alone a whole lot right now in my life. But I still love meeting people. Like yeah. I go out of my way to meet people. I love hearing their stories, learning about their lives. So I can imagine if I were to travel alone, you'd, you'd just meet so many people. Yeah. Or if you were to come on a Jamesley trip, because that is the, like, you are exactly my clientele. Like I have a lot of women who have families who just want to meet other people and like, you know, tap into that sense of adventure that gets lost in our busy day-to-day lives. So small group tours, especially small group tours of women, um, are so fun. And like the friendships that I've seen formed on my tours are really cool. Like really, really cool. Well, I want to go on one now. So I'm wondering, what are your upcoming tours? Yeah, so what do you I, have planned in 2022? Jordan. Um, Jordan's on there. Turkey. We do Morocco frequently. Oh. Um, Egypt frequently. Um, I also have an insane safari right now in Kenya um, and we're staying at the giraffe manor which is like impossible to get into so I don't know how I figured out a way to get in it's wild because they have when like that eight one? rooms um so it's the f- we actually have two trips going there the first is in January it's sold out the second is in February 2023 okay because I had a trip booked my husband and I did when we lived in L- London to Kenya and now I cannot remember something happened and we couldn't go. And now I'm totally blanking on why we had to cancel it. And I haven't yeah. thought about it since. So yeah. it's, it's really cool. And I love, I love Damesley and I love my business because I love being able to play. Like I love thinking of things like that I really want to do. Like I always wanted to stay in the giraffe manor. Right. But it's like insanely expensive and so hard to get into because like celebrities go there and they have eight rooms. So, um, so I was like, well, what if I just tried it, you know, and I love that sense of play. Like I want to swim with the pigs in the Bahamas. So like right now I'm working on a trip to do that. You know? <laughs> yeah. like, like, How about I'm Thailand? Like, yeah. I'm like dying to go to Thailand. <laughs> I wrote a guidebook on Thailand. It was the first guidebook that Go Girl ever did. So like, yeah, we should totally go to Thailand, you know? And then the other part of it is like, well, not everybody wants to go on a small group tour. So now, you know, we also do custom planning, which is really fun because then you can say to me, like, I want to take my family to Thailand. I have 10 days. Give me, every, give me the best of what you got. And I can be like, I got you. That's amazing. <laughs> oh, you're doing so lunch cool. here. You're doing, you know, you're going to see this temple and this temple. Then you're going to go to the floating market and then you're going to take a plane. You're going to go up to Chiang Mai. Like I will, I, it's so fun for me to be able to give other people those travel experiences, even if they oh. don't want to do it in a group of strangers. Yeah. Oh, I'm like so excited right now. Um, yeah. so. It's so fun. <laughs> I'm like, Honestly. I want to go plan a trip right now. Yeah. And, and yeah. if you're listening to this, like we are also in a big hiring phase right now. So like we're looking for trip designers. If you're like, if you are a person who is detail oriented and loves to travel, please get a hold of me. <laughs> and we will link up all of Kelly's information. Yeah. 
in the yeah. show notes. So, you know, we'd love to dive in and talk a little bit more about your book. And I know you talked about um, the book and just kind of what drove you to write about it. Can you share like one story of one of the women that you interviewed um, and just share her inspiring story from the book? Because there's so many. And like when I was so reading many. it, like the experiences that these women's ha- women had and the challenges are you, you, you cover like every, I feel like every life yeah, challenge. We so do. Maybe just yeah. one. Yeah. So there's a, a story that I love um, by a woman named Leslie Pitt who lost her leg as a child. She was actually hit by a, a gravel truck when she was like six years old and she lost her left leg from the knee down. Um, and so she, of course she was told like she couldn't do so many things in her life, but she just also similarly adopted an attitude of like, yes, I can, I can do all of these things. So she goes through her life and then, you know, in adulthood, she starts a company that creates um, prosthetic limbs, access to prosthetic limbs for children in developing nations. And so, you know how I was talking about like my loop ending my trauma loop, like that was her trauma loop and it's ending. And I think it is so powerful when we can take the painful things that happen to us and find a way to make it into something good for other people. And so I love her story because she does exactly that. And she wrote a children's book. that's all about, you know, um, varying abilities and, you know, how we need to look at each other as like who we are, not what we have or don't have. And so I just love how she continues to perpetuate this message and how much good she's doing in the world based on her own painful experience. That, that was the, I remember reading that one. That, that's a great story. And I love that she wrote the book because I'm sure as a child going through that experience where you're being picked on and made fun of, you know, it's nice to see and hear those messages from others that are in a similar, in a similar situation. And I really tried to choose a really diverse array of stories from women of varying races, varying cultures, varying age groups, because this happens like all the time, right? So one of my other favorite stories is of Sandra Hart, who was always told that she couldn't be an actress. It wasn't a good job. She was going to go to college, blah, blah, blah. All she wanted to do was be an actress. So she ended up becoming an actress in her 50s um, and working with like Dick Wolf, doing SVU, doing all sorts of things. And then at 81, she decides to launch a YouTube channel. She has six million subscribers now unbelievable oh (laughs) my gosh I love those kind of stories (laughs) so that's the thing it's like there's never a time when you don't get to choose what you want to do you just have to commit and just do it you have to launch into it believe that you can do it and do it and that's what I love about Sandra Hart like one of her her quotes that she told me is like you know the secret sauce is believing that you're worthy and that you deserve and it's so hard to sometimes believe that you're worthy and you deserve, you know, but yeah. like when you do and you just, you just don't care what other people think and you just do something like how many, how many people do you think in her life are like, really, you're going to start this YouTube yeah. thing? Like, you know, like <laughs> of course people came on and said that, you know, but like, look at what she's done. Six million subscribers. Like get out. It. That's a wrap. I want, you know, to drop the mic. <laughs> she's amazing. <laughs> she's a That's wonderful crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So So, Kelly, you've left us already with so much inspiration, but as we start to wrap up a little bit, we do love to leave our listeners with some tips that they can immediately implement into their lives. Can you share, you know, maybe something that some women could maybe start to do today to prioritize themselves and treat themselves with love, maybe plan a trip, like yeah. Any ideas? Well, I mean, I think it starts with believing that you can, right? It's all a mindset. So really believing that you can do something. And if you have a nagging idea, like also trying to see it as like your gift, like you have a, an obligation to the idea to create it, right? And don't deprive the world of your gifts, your creations, your thoughts, your ideas, your businesses, because you have a negative belief that you can't do something. So I think it all starts with belief. And if you want to travel, buy the ticket, like take (laughs) positive action, you know? Sometimes just putting yourself on the hook for something like makes you do the thing, right? So it's like, just buy the ticket to Costa Rica and then figure out all the details, right? So then figure out where you're gonna stay, then figure out 
you know, how you're going to get around, like just do something that gives you, gives you accountability by the domain name. Um, so I think it's like, it, and by the way, like belief work, mindset work is a lifelong process. You know, we're not always every day going to walk around feeling like, I'm worthy. <laughs> I deserve this. You know, like you have to constantly remind yourself of that, but you have to start and examine. Like if you, if you're not feeling like that, you know, like I did for many years, examine why, like, where does that come from? Trace that back and try to, you know, try to give yourself some peace just in realigning your mindset. And I think it's something that women in particular struggle with, right. More than anyone else. Like, and I just, I, I, I hate to see how many things did not, like I think about how many things did not get created because we didn't believe that we could. Yeah, you know, we didn't believe that we were strong enough. We didn't believe that we were the people that were supposed to create them. So everything starts with mindset. Believe in yourself and take positive action. Oh, that's such wonderful advice for everyone in so many areas. And it starts with children. You know, children should hear that advice too. Absolutely. I'm not, not just adults. Yeah, yes. absolutely. I mean, if I had a book like the one that I wrote when I was a kid, God, it would have given me so much hope because I didn't really have anywhere to look. Like I didn't really have anyone that was like, I want to be like her, you know, it was just like, I want to get out. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes that's, that's the path. And sometimes, you know, you need someone like there's other ladies in my book who were like, yeah, I, you know, I saw my boyfriend's mother was so kind and his family was so different and it showed me what a family should look like or, you know, you don't always have role models to look to, you know, you just, you just have to move forward and, and, and hold on to that light that like you're special and your life can be whatever you desire it to be. Mm. So inspiring. So inspiring. So Kelly, where can people find you, you know, learn about your trips? learn about the conference that you have, all the things that you're doing. I am all over the internet at go Kelly Lewis. Um, and you can get the book at tell her she can't.com. I like to buy domains right when I come up with ideas. So I have like 34 domains, <laughs> <laughs> but you can find me at go Kelly Lewis. Okay. Thank awesome. you. And I think that the book is like a perfect gift for like all the women in your life. And I'm looking at the copy. You can I can see it right now. Right yeah, I you. love that it's sitting behind you. Yeah. It's hot pink. It's hot pink. Yeah. So, yeah. Who doesn't like hot pink? Well, I know some people don't, but I, it's my favorite color. So, um, <laughs> but just a great book that inspirational, you know, even just think about like graduation season, what to give to someone or a birthday. So yeah. encourage yeah. everyone to go out there and buy the book. Thank you. Um, yeah. So as we wrap up this conversation, one question we like to ask all of our guests is what does the art of living well mean to you? Oh, the art of living well to me. So honestly, the first thing that comes to my mind is freedom. Like the art of living well means I get the freedom to choose what I want to do in my life, where I want to go in my life um, and how I want to approach my life. Right. So for me, that's like number one. Um, but I also think it's like really coming to terms with where you are in your healing journey, you know, and, and starting it and being unafraid to dig in the more uncomfortable corners of, of our lives and our pasts, right? Because once we, once we get past that ickiness, like we are able to let go of a lot of pain and hurt and stress. And the relief of that is life-changing. Like it's literally like taking off a weighted blanket, you know? So for me, living well means having the freedom to go where I want and, you know, the ability and the blessing really to be able to dig into my life and my psyche and, and heal the parts of me that need to be healed so that I can help inspire other people um, and encourage them on their journey. That is so beautiful. And you are already inspiring people on their journey. So thank you for all that you're doing for women out there everywhere. Um, and I think Marnie and I should look into your tours and try to plan a getaway. Yes. Let's yes. do it. Yes. Anywhere you want to go. <laughs> I would, I would love it. I would love Bali. it. You know, and sometimes <laughs> as a mom, it's hard to get away for, with your whole family. So yeah. I think it'd actually be easy for, easier for one person, you know, with schedules and things to get away. 
Totally. I know. Oh. And now it's, it's cool too with James because it's like, you know, I know we're all busy. We're all stressed out. We're all burned out all the time. So it's like, I want to give you guys like the experience of a lifetime. Like I want to give you the treats that you won't treat yourself, you know, like mm -hmm. it's going to be fun. It's going to be luxe. It's going to be adventure. It's going to be all the things. And like, I just want people to, to take a step out of their lives, use travel as the medium to do that and come back refreshed and re-energized and like excited, you know, about the things that they've seen and, and what they're doing in their, their life journey. So. Love awesome. that. Yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited. Goal. I'm, I'm motivated. So. <laughs> so thank you so much, Kelly. And, you know, wish you a wonderful day. Wonderful thank end of the so year. Thank you so much for having me. This was so yeah. fun. And um, yeah, I appreciate you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Art of Living Well podcast. We are so grateful that you joined us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or anyone else you think may benefit from this information. We'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and tag the Art of Living Well podcast on social media. If you want more inspiration in between episodes, you can find us on social media at the Art of Living underscore well on Instagram and Facebook where we will share snippets from our daily lives and our journey to living well.